So before this video gets started, a couple of things. One, my iconic orange sweater has a hole. This made me sad. I don't know how much longer I can wear this one. I'm hoping I can get it fixed. But in the meantime, so one of my supporters, I had no idea that the sweater had just lost its elbow, messaged me out of the blue saying, hey, can I send you something? I got a new sweater and it's Erin Wolf. Uh, there's a part of Ireland when I was over there in 2019 on the trip that got me into sailing. Um, I had my nephew with me and I, there was this like thatched roof. I'll, I'll put a picture of it here. It was like a thatched roof pink store called the Sweater Shop right outside the Aran Islands. So I stopped in and that's where I found that Aran or that orange sweater. This one is Aran wool as well. Wool made from sheep that live near the Aran Islands in Ireland. Um, yee! Thank you very much, Andrew. I love it. And for everyone else, you're going to be seeing this a lot because it's November right now. Now, back to business. At the end of the last video, I was sitting in the boat's quarter berth and thinking to myself, I need to make some decisions. <sighs> a decision has been made. <sighs> this heavy boy is the Golden Motor 10 kilowatt brushless DC, three phase permanent magnet AC motor. Well, the three phase AC permanent magnet motor. Takes 48 volts. Uh, yeah, it takes 48 volts. Well, it's three phase. How does that work? Anyways, it's listed as a 48 volt battery. More importantly, uh, I got the Kelly controller. What is it? The KLS 72100NC. That's Kilo Lima Sierra 72100 November Charlie for anyone who wants to play along at home. Now, uh, a choice was made, but I didn't explain why, and that's what this video is going to be about. There's some footage I have for one or two other videos still that are in the past from me right now, but in the future from the previous video. How's that for consistency? I wanted to record this video first because I know a lot of people join the channel after the whole trip home started, and the channel has been dominated for months now with boat content. And book content will be back, but there's going to be a series where I have to figure out how all of this works. I bought my boat from day one with the plan to convert it to electric. In fact, various concerns needed to convert it to electric was why I chose Landfall 38 and bought that specific boat. For those of you who've been watching or who went back and watched the old videos, I, I don't like this seasons thing. I, I don't want to pretend like I'm sort of, sort of big show or anything like that because I'm not. But I guess you can sort of think of the early days of the channel, which was when I was figuring out how to build the batteries, how to figure out all the electrics, because I didn't know anything when I started, as sort of phase one. Buying the boat, fixing the boat up, and sailing the boat home was kind of phase two. So if I'm, if I'm continuing that logic, this video is the start of phase three. The next big task, which I'm going to use this winter for, is I need to figure out not only how to get this controller talking to this motor, I need to develop controls to control the controller, which then powers and controls the motor. I could have done it the easy way and just bought canned throttles and key switches and whatnot, but where's the fun in that? So I'm not doing that. I'm gonna do everything myself using a, focus on that please. Can you focus on that? Using a little mini Arduino. And I've got a contactor. I, one of the benefits of not buying a kit is, oh, there's fuses in there. One of the benefits of not buying a kit is that I can choose every component myself. I don't want to name any companies because I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm putting anyone down, but a lot of the pre-canned kits where you get the motor, the controller, the throttles, the controls, the wiring, and all of that into one, they don't generally necessarily use the highest quality components. This is a little fuse contactor rated more than what I ever need for this because I like to over-engineer everything. Anyway, typically when you buy a golden motor motor, you get, I think it's a Curtis 
I think it's a card, it's a controller that comes with it, and they everything just plugs in and works. And again, you can buy the kits with the throttles and everything, you just buy everything, plug it in and go. To me, regen is one of the primary ways that I expect to recharge my batteries when I'm on passage, when I'm offshore for a long period of time and I don't have any way to plug in. I will have solar panels, and I'm hoping the solar panels will offset the power I use on the boat, because I'm having electric galley and whatnot, so my, my house loads are going to be fairly high. But for constant slow charging, I really want to be able to regen off the propeller. So being able to regen while I'm under sails, while I'm, the sails are pulling the boat through the water, they'll spin the propeller, which spins the motor, which generates electricity into the controller, which then feeds it into the battery bank. When I was looking for regen information for the different controllers, I couldn't find a lot of data. Of the ones I could find, the Kelly controllers had the most technical data. They did not have a regen curve, but they had information on all of the pinouts and programming information, instructions and whatnot. It was very technical. I am certain there are projects out there that have mixed a Kelly controller with a golden motor, but I haven't seen any yet. I haven't found any yet, not that I've looked particularly hard. So figuring out how to connect this harness, all of the controls that go into this is what tells the controller you know, what direction do I want to go, how fast do I want to go, yada yada yada. Whether it's in regen, how aggressive the regen is. I could just make the stuff I need and just connect it, but I don't want to do that. I want to have... First of all, I want the controls to look classic, to fit it with, a, with the 80s aesthetic. So, for example, the throttle I want to make out of wood. I don't know what kind of wood yet. I'll probably go down to AM and see what they have nice... I mean, teak's too expensive, so probably not teak, but something classy. Maybe I'll splurge on a bit of teak. Anyways, point is, I want the controls to look period correct. I also want to be able to collect all of the data coming from the motor and the controller and feed it onto the boat's network because eventually I'm going to have a database where I want to have constant incoming telemetrics that I can record and graph, analyze, and one day, this is sometime down the road, actually be able to control the motor from software. It's it's going to be fun. But all of this is relying on me having some sort of a computer, and that's where the Arduino comes in. Now, I know some of you are going to say, but why not a Raspberry Pi? This is the throttle inputs. This is the... I mean, th this faulting on me would be very, very, very bad. The Arduino doesn't really have an operating system. It's not really a computer. It's basically a user-friendly PIC chip. Um, so when you turn it on, the software is almost instantly ready to go. It's much, much, much simpler code. There's fewer things to go wrong. I probably will have RPIs or NUX or something similar to NUX on the boat. But for the something as critical as controlling the motor, I wanted the simplest tool that would do the job. Hence the Arduino. There it is. Now, this video is not going to go much more into detail on the controller, but I made decisions and I want to share it with you because mostly I'm excited and I want to share it with you. I don't know how any of this works. My friend Andrew, if you watch the videos when I was trying to build my buck converters and various other times, he's an electrical engineer. He, he's helping me with this. He pointed me to this. This is basically a wiper potentiometer. So if you've ever seen the throttles on a boat, it's generally forward to go forward and the harder you press it, the further, or the further you push it, the faster you go, and then you go to center and you come back. What this does is, as the throttle is moving back and forth, a wiper basically just presses in, like a little acrylic ball with a spring behind it presses in on this, and it changes the resistance value coming out of these pins. And that is then read by the Arduino to calculate the throttle position, and then from that, send a corresponding voltage. Um, there's two ways you can run this. Again, I don't want to get into too much detail, but it's fundamentally between 0 and 5 volts. If it's all the way down to 0, turn off the motor. If it's all the way up to 5, go full speed, somewhere in between, and it's some speed in between. There is an option where you can set it to 2.5 be the break point, so less than 2.5 is reverse and above 2.5 is forward, or you can just have a separate forward reverse and then set it. There's lots of things to sort out. Point is, that's one of the other reasons I wanted to have the Arduino. It allows me to have really nice digital controls, but still keep everything looking really classic. So enough on that, let me talk about the sizing of the motor, how I decided on it, the sizing of the controller, and why I decided on it. Now, one of the things that is a little bit different about my project than most of the other projects I've seen online is the level of technical detail I plan to cover on this channel. Partly because I'm learning as I go and I just don't know what I'm doing yet. And part of the channel is just sort of recording the whole process of learning. But I'm kind of hoping that if anybody else decides to do their own conversion, this being so detailed might give them a better idea of how to do it. 
So in that spirit, let me talk in a little bit of technical detail about why I chose this motor. If you think about converting your boat to electric or anything else that's currently powered by a combustion engine into electric, one of the first questions people have is, well, what size electric motor do I need? Mathematically, I believe, I might be wrong on this, one kilowatt is equivalent to 1.3 horsepower. So on the simplest terms, I've got a 30 horsepower peak, 27 horsepower continuous motor, which I know you're div like dividing and multiplying slightly off, but we're just getting vague numbers here. So if I did 27 times, what is it, 0 0.7, 1.3, I would need 19 kilowatts, 18, 19 kilowatts. Let's say 20 kilowatts to nicely round out the number to get a mathematical equivalent power out of my motor that I can get out of my diesel. To do that, that's shaft kilowatt out. So to get 19, 20 kilowatts out, that means I have to figure out what is the efficiency of the motor at 20 kilowatts. Let's say 80%, just, just that's somewhat realistic and relatively easy number to do math on. That means that I would need about 24 kilowatts going into the motor to get 20 kilowatts out. Again, very rough numbers. The problem with that is that it's very, very important to me to follow, to stay within ABYC standards. American Boat and Yacht Commission, something, I always forget what it stands for, but they basically set the standards for boats. Not because they have any authority to do so, but because most insurance companies want you to match them, so or meet their requirements. So if you don't meet the requirements, it's hard to get insurance. So de facto, they set the standards and having insurance is very important to me. So, ABYC says that anything over 60 volts DC is high voltage. Anything less than 60 volts is low voltage. I very, 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 very much want to stay in the low voltage regime and for a couple of reasons. One, it's literally safer. B, all of the Victron kit that's out there, which I am building my boat around, caps out at like 48 volt class. 48 volt class is, goes up to about 60 volts, 58 volts, something like that. Because my batteries are 48 volt and my charger is 48 volt and my inverter is 48 volt, it meant that I had to have a 48 volt controller and a 48 volt motor. 48 volt class with lithium iron phosphate batteries, your, your, your standard voltage is around 51.2 volts. So if I take my 24,000 watts and I divide it by 51.2, that's 468, say 470 amps. That's a lot of amps. That's a whole lot of amps. Amps are what dictate fuse sizes, wire sizes, etc. It's just not really feasible. I've come to realize. Here's where marketing pisses me off. This is rated as a 600 amp controller. It, it, it seems that all of the controllers do this. That 600 amps is two minutes peak. That is not continuous. Continuous is generally 40% of that, meaning this 600 amp controller is actually 240 amp continuous, air-cooled, 360 amp water-cooled. This is a optional aluminum heat block or a heat sink cooling block, whatever you want to call it, which I ordered. So if I do 240 amps, which is the max cooling, times 51.2 volts, that gives me 12,288 watts that I can have continuously coming out of this controller in theory without it overheating. Now, as I mentioned, most of the Golden Motors come with, I believe, a Curtis controller. One of the other reasons that I chose Kelly over the Curtis is that I mentioned about how they have a lot more technical documentation, pinouts and whatnot. But the other one is that I, had a, I saw a lot of people complaining about the Curtis's overheating and derating, meaning they cut the power going to the motor, you can't get as much power, you can't go as fast. With air cooling then, the maximum output is 12.3 kilowatts. With water cooling, 360, that's 18.4 kilowatts. That just simply means what these can run at without cooking. That doesn't speak to the wires that go, do, go to them. Now, one thing I'm not entirely enamored with with these motors is that the wires that come with it, they give you two of them that you can double up for double the amperage. But I'm assuming I might be able to crack this open and get out these wires and potentially change them internally, but I haven't torn it apart yet. So at this point in time, these wires can't be changed. 
Again, I'm sure they can be, but they don't ship in an easy to change way. Those two wires, they don't strike me as being able to run 360 amps continuously. When you're dealing with electrics, you're always gonna be limited by the weakest piece. So if you've got a long thin wire, it doesn't matter what everything else is rated at, that long thin wire is gonna set the max you can safely carry, etc., etc. The key thing is, is that the 600, 600 amp controller is one of the highest power controllers I could get for 48 volt. Most electric cars, they run at much, much higher voltages. So if you've got any relatively recent electric car, it's gonna be running at least 200 volts. Most modern electric cars are running at 400 or even 800 volts. As the voltage goes up, the amperage comes down. So by running at really high voltages, it means they can get away with much smaller wires, which is why they do it. But it's also why if you ever look at an EV, they've got big orange wires and there's all the safety stuff to disconnect it. It's much more difficult to deal with high voltage safely. High voltage DC will kill you without even thinking twice. Well, you won't think twice because you'll be dead very quickly, but I digress. So if you could recall a moment ago, we were talking about how to get 20 kilowatts, which would be the one kilowatt is 1.3 horsepower to keep it one for one with the diesel I'm pulling out. I would need to have 24 kilowatts or what was it almost 470 amps whatever the number was I said it's just it's just not happening it's just not happening now if you look in the market you will find 20 amp and 30 amp motors at 48 volts but generally what they've done is they've paired these up so you have two separate controllers two separate motors running in parallel combining their output power to get what you ask for so originally my plan was I was going to buy two of these and I would have them set up in parallel so if I needed a lot of power fighting heavy currents or whatever I could take a belt run across from one motor to the other motor down to the prop shaft and back up and run the two motors in parallel. These controllers have a CAN bus option, which I ordered, and the CAN bus option will allow two controllers to talk to each other to sync their outputs. The biggest reason I was gonna do that though, for reasons I'll explain very shortly, is I want redundancy. I plan to be very far away. If something breaks, I wanna have something I can switch over to. Setting aside redundancy for a minute, I honestly don't think I need more than 10 kilowatts, period. And you might be saying to yourself, but that's only 13 horsepower. How could that possibly work when you're replacing a 30, 27 horsepower diesel? Anybody who's driven an electric car knows that one of the crazy things about any electric car is its instant torque. They call it the EV grin. You hit the accelerator, and poof, you're back. It's fantastic. If you look at the power curve and the torque curve for a diesel engine like mine, here it is you'll notice that peak horsepower and peak torque happen at very specific engine RPMs and they're not the same thing. Horsepower and torque are two different things as well. With an electric motor, you get all the torque instantly. So the effective pushing power of an electric motor is much better. When I started this project, the numbers I was always seeing was one kilowatt is equivalent to roughly two or three horsepower where it fell in there depended on losses to gearing and stuffing boxes and prop size and blah, 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 a bunch of other things. So going by that then, the 10 kilowatt motor is equivalent to between 20 and 30 horsepower in effective pushing power, not mathematical, put it on a torque meter type of thing, the effective ability to push your boat. I was thinking, well, okay, if that's the case, I should really get 15 kilowatt, but because of the amperage issues we talked about a moment ago, the highest I could find was 10 kilowatt. That was kind of why I was thinking of getting two of them for the few times I need the extra power. But I've been looking at other projects that have done electric conversions, and I found a project, um, SV Bombadil, I think it is. Fantastic name for anybody who likes Lord of the Rings. I reached out to him and I asked him, did you measure the input kilowatts at various boat speeds in basically flat calm waters? And he did, and he gave them to me. And this made me very excited. I believe that him and his partner have an Ericsson 39, what is it, 39B. Its displacement is 8.6 metric tons to my 7.6 metric tons. So my boat is about one ton dry, lighter than his. My length of the water line is 11.45 meters. Uh, what is that in feet? 37.6 feet compared to his 11.89 meters or 39 feet. So he's slightly longer waterline length. His beam is 3.45 to my beam, which is 3.6 meters, which uh, again, sorry, feet. So his beam is 11.3 feet wide. Mine is 12 feet wide. So he's a little heavier, a little longer, a little narrower, but within shooting match of mine. And he got 
uh, I believe it was the Thunderstruck 10 kilowatt motor, which is also a 10 kilowatt three phase PMAC motor, not a golden motor. And I wasn't able to find the efficiency curves, but close enough that given the differences in the boats, we can round things out very gently here. So when I reached out to him and I asked him for what were the numbers you were seeing when you were pushing through the water, he gave me the numbers and they proved to be fascinating. Now, he gave me one knot, two knot, three knot, four knot, five knot, and six knot. One knot and two knot, I'm gonna largely ignore. The reason for that is that at that speed, you're running so low and the motors are so inefficient that it hardly matters. If I was trying to maximize range, I don't see myself going lower than three knots. Let's be realistic here. Three knots is already pretty darn slow. At three knots, he was able to push his boat with 1,050 watts input to the motor. More on this in a minute. So assuming that his motor has the same efficiency down that low as mine, which is shit, the output power is about... 300 watts. Input 1000, output 300. 30%, 29% efficiency, it's pretty garbage down there. But the point is, is with 300 watts coming out of the motor, the things are gonna be moving without a lot of power, but it's still enough to get up to three knots. The amount of power it takes to push a boat through the water, it goes up like this. It, it's like an exponential chart. So going really slow takes very little power, but as you start to ramp up, the power need is going to start to increase dramatically. Here's an example. At four knots, he needs 2450 watts input, which translates to about two kilowatts output. So from about 300 watts to get three knots to two kilowatts to get four knots. And you can see this continue further. This is why people have teleprompters. I don't. So for five knots, he's running 4750 watts in, which again, if his efficiency is similar to mine, is 4200 watts out. So you can see from three knots at 300 watts to four knots at two kilowatt to five knots at 4.2 kilowatts, how quickly it goes up. And to get to, to, get to six knots, he needs 8.38 kilowatts of input power, which is about 73, 7,400 watts output power. Again, assuming a similar efficiency to this motor. That shouldn't make sense. And it kind of doesn't, but it does. I think it speaks more to the inefficiency of a diesel engine more than anything else. The key thing is, is that up until I spoke to him, I was working purely on theoretical numbers. This is the closest project I've found similar to mine. And so I give these numbers a lot of merit. I don't remember exactly what propeller he has. I believe he has a 15 inch three blade fixed, three fixed blade um, propeller. I'm planning to get the Brunton EcoStar 430 millimeter, which is about a 17 inch propeller. I took a bunch of measurements. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about the propeller in another video, but it's a propeller designed specifically for electric propulsion. So I think all things considered, I can probably do better than his numbers, which if those numbers are correct, this 10 kilowatt is probably more than I ever need. Now, I shouldn't say that because this is in dead flat calm waters. If I'm going into a current or into a headwind, I'm going to need that power to get speed over ground, just despite what the speed in water might be. So for all these reasons, that's why I think this motor is going to be fine. In fact, I think this motor might be a bit of a problem. It might be too big in certain circumstances. So I believe I mentioned a short moment ago that I was planning to have two 10 kilowatt motors in partial theory that I could run them together to get effectively 20 kilowatt, 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 I want to get 20 kilowatt, 20 kilowatt effective pushing power. But when I realized I didn't think I was ever going to need that, I started thinking, okay, well, the main reason I wanted two motors was redundancy. If I lose a motor, I don't want to be stranded. Y you saw my trip home. I've already experienced that and it sucked. I want to do that again. So the plan is to have a second motor, second controller, and I'm eventually going to have to deal with cooling. That's a whole other topic I'm not going to go into yet. Everything's going to be completely two independent systems. The plan is to have the two motors side by side with a belt that if I need to switch from one motor to the other, I can literally just release a tensioner and move the belt over to the other motor, tension it, and now I've got a different motor, which for redundancy is super easy to swap between. But once I realized I probably didn't need 10 kilowatt, and when I got SV Bombadil's numbers, I started realizing that one of the ultimate goals of this project is to show that I can build an electric boat that doesn't compromise range. 
And I know a whole lot of people just said, oh, for, I get it, I get it. But I still think I can do it. One of the common challenges I often get when I tell people that I'm converting to electric and I plan to do crossings with it is, well, what happens if you get stuck in the doldrums? What happens in this situation? What happens in that situation? Similarly, one of the questions I've been asked since I got home was, could I have done the trip home if I had already converted to electric? If I was already running this, could I have done that trip I just did? I think I can. I mentioned when I was looking at the numbers that to do three knots, it was 1,050 watts input to get 300 watts output. That's 29% efficient. Electric motors towards the bottom of their speed, the, the efficiency just falls off a cliff. So up on the screen right here, you're seeing the efficiency and performance curve of the electric motor, specifically the 10 kilowatt. I'll show you the five kilowatt in a minute. But the thing to note is at the beginning, you see how the efficiency just falls literally off a cliff. That's why at 1050 watts input, I was only getting three, or I would only get 300 watts output. So if I wanted to run at three knots because I was trying to get the most range I possibly could, that means that I'm only running at 29% efficiency, meaning that a lot of the battery power, over 60% of it, actually over 70% of it, is just wasted. It's just gone. It's not moving the boat. 70%. It's ridiculous if I'm trying to maximize my range. So I got to look in at the five kilowatt motor and here's the five kilowatt performance curve. Now, You'll notice the efficiency has the same collapse, but if you look at the vertical lines, the wattage is very different. I'm gonna provide links to these PDFs so that if you wanna actually see them side by side, because I know it's gonna be hard to see it on the screen, they'll be in the description below. So the test data that you're seeing here, it's tested at relatively arbitrary points, as far as I can tell, and I can't map directly one for one what the efficiency is at a particular speed. To really get this data, I need to do this data collection myself once the boat's converted. But the key thing to note here is at 997 input watts, the output is 292 watts. It's just pathetic. For 900 watts, 890 watts input on the five kilowatt, I'm getting 632, 633 watts output. Less input, double the output, more than doubles the output. So at low speed, the five kilowatt is far more efficient. And it's not just at the super low speeds. If I was cruising home, if I was doing the trip home that I just did, I could see myself being content averaging four knots. At four knots, the 10 kilowatt requires about 2450. So with the 10 kilowatt motor, to get about two kilowatts out, which was roughly the speed for Bombadil to be able to hit four knots, I need 2,500 watts input power. That's 500 watts wasted per hour. To get 2,000 watts output from the five kilowatt is 2,200 watts input on the five kilowatt. That's 300 watt hour difference. That means that if I wanna push at four knots, I have the equivalent of a 300 watt solar panel being saved at the exact same output speed simply by running on the five kilowatt motor instead of the 10 kilowatt motor that I've got here. Once you hit five knots, the differences are effectively null and obviously the five kilowatt taps out long before the 10 kilowatt. So if I need more power, I definitely need the 10 kilowatt. So because of this, the current plan is to run the two motors with the two belts, as I mentioned, and just move the belts back and forth depending on whether I wanna optimize for power or for range on any given day, at any given point in the trip. I know you could do clutches and all these various things to automate switching between them, but I wanna keep the, the system as simple as possible. So shutting things down and moving a belt isn't gonna be the end of the world, especially if I design the mounts for these things with that in mind. Let's turn to talk about batteries. So back in the early days of this channel, I bought enough cells to build one 280 amp hour, 48 volt battery, 51.2 volt battery. And that's the battery that I broke up into the 12 volt battery that saved my bum on the trip home when I had the problem with the alternator. I got to thinking, why don't I make that a 48 volt battery and run seven 280 amp hour batteries for the house and propulsion bank? So my friend Andrew, different one from the sweater, he's been helping me on the boat periodically. And we went down and I sat there and I started looking at a lot of measurements and I realized I can do it. I can put all seven 48 volt batteries into the boat, I have enough space. Weight might be a problem. Weight is almost certainly going to be a problem. 
so there's going to be some experimenting. But the current plan, not factoring for weight, but as I say that, knowing I will have to factor for weight, I can put five batteries where the engine currently is. Some of this space is going to be lost to the mount for the motor. Now I'm getting a new propeller made. I could bring the propeller forward some, which I may need to do to get my clearance for the pulley anyway. And then the motor will hopefully mount facing this way, bumping up against here, leaving me the majority of the space aft. But with that wall out, which we took out before, and a platform across the engine mounts, I should have a nice big flat area for batteries. There's a weight issue too. The more I can get forward, the more weight I can have without destabilizing the boat or causing her to be uh, down by the aft. Behind the motors towards where the diesel tank is, I have enough space that I can put at least four batteries flat. And if I tilt them on their sides, I'll sh we'll go into more of this later, I can put them in like five cartridges side by side. And that means I can slide any one of them out if I need to. So with the five batteries where the engine is, Six will fit into where the black water tank used to be. So if you remember where the nav station is, where you would normally sit on the nav station, um, that's where I took the black water tank out of. I can put a battery in there. And on the quarter berth, where I installed the Phoenix charger, where the water pump is and the water filter and whatnot, I can put a, um, the seventh battery there. That puts the weight somewhat fairly forward, but it's still quite a bit back from the mast. Yeah. Probably the plan will be I will put the boat or I will put all seven batteries in we'll put the boat in the water And I'll just see how she sets because remember I've still got to build a solar arch and there's a bunch of things I need to do I, I don't want the boat sailing like this obviously I did check I could either take out the v-birth tank and put two batteries up there or I could take the two settee tanks out shorten them put a battery on either side and have smaller water tanks. And that would move another roughly 400 pounds forward. And that I am pretty confident would work, albeit at the loss of water. So saying all of that, that means that I will have 1,920 amp hours at 51.2 volts for the house and propulsion bank. Said another way, 100.3 kilowatt hours. That's insane, that's ridiculous. And it also means that if I really have to sacrifice a couple of batteries at the end of the day, I'll probably still be okay. But this gets back to the thing that people are always saying, you can't do, you're not gonna be able to do this once you convert to electric, you're not gonna be able to do that once you convert to electric. So if I have 100,300 watt hours, and I know that it takes 2200 watt hours, what is it? 2220 watt hours to get 2027 watt hours out of the motor, which should push me at about four knots, that means 45 hours of running at four knots in flat calm conditions. That's almost two straight days, non-stop. And that assumes no input power from solar, but it also doesn't assume any house loads either. So I'm, I'm, I'm not factoring those because I'm hoping those will be a wash. If I was doing that with a 10 kilowatt, if I was doing that with a 10 kilowatt motor, to do the exact same speed or almost exactly the same speed, that reduces my run time to 39.7 hours. Still a ridiculously large number, but that's almost a six hour, actually it's over a six hour difference in run time, simply by being able to choose whether I'm running on my 10 or my five kilowatt. So it makes a big difference in real world. Now, if I have my mass down, and I wanted to do the trip home like I did on this trip. Obviously the New York and the Chesapeake and whatnot, I'd have the mast up. But once I got to the Catskills and I dropped my mast, I had to do the rest of the trip purely on the motor. So in a situation like that, where I'm running rivers and running canals, something I very much wanna do, especially over in Europe at some point, the mast is gonna be down and I'm not gonna have the option to regen off sail because you can't sail on the rivers and the canals as I could not sail on the Erie Canal and the Welland Canal on the way home. So in that situation, my goal was, could I make it so that an hour of propulsion burns less power than an hour of charge? So one of the things I'm looking at right now was, I had originally bought the Quattro, which you saw in the previous videos when I was doing all of the battery charging. I am going to sell that and I am going to get two 
MultiPlus 5000 VA, so same VA, MultiPlus inverter chargers. The reason I'm getting two of them is one's going to be 230 volt 50 hertz, the other one's going to be 120 volt 60 hertz, and I will be able to use pigtails on my shore power cables to be able to plug in regardless of where I am in the world rather than trying to use an auto transformer. And the reason for that is because both of them will charge at 57.8 volts at 70 amps. It works out to just over four kilowatts of charging current, regardless of whether I'm on 120 volt or whether I'm on 230 volt. Now, that's assuming that I can find myself a 50 amp 120 volt or a 32 amp 230 volt, depending on where I am. Sometimes that's not going to be the case. So, Almost all marinas and places that you can plug in a boat can give you at least 120 volt 30 amp or 230 volt 16 amp. 120 volt at 30 amp is equivalent to 3600 watts. 230 volt 16 amp is also about 3680 watts. So in either situation, I can pull in, let's say 3500 watts, just to have an easy number. Even in a modest situation, I can get at least 3500 watts. If I can get a higher amperage, then I can get four kilo or 4000 watts into the batteries, if my average burn rate is under 3,600, 3,500 watts, which we've seen at four knots speed over ground, assuming Bombadil is a good stand-in for Mermaid's Rest, that's no problem whatsoever. At 2,200 watts, I can put about an hour and a half of travel time into my batteries for each hour of plug-in time. If I can stop somewhere on, when I'm running rivers and rubbing canals, as I did on the trip home, and plug into shore power, be it at a free dock, be it by paying at a marina, I won't have to run a generator to keep my batteries topped up. And with that range, I can miss a couple of days if I can't find anywhere to plug in and I can keep going. I was averaging eight to 10 hours each day on the trip home with a 45 hour runtime on a 100 kilowatt hour battery bank. That means I could go in theory four to five days without finding a place to charge. Now, if I run the battery down that low, I'm probably not charging overnight. I stay an extra day, I explore a town. By the time I come back, my batteries are charged. Similarly, if I get caught in the doldrums, one of the other things I hear a lot of people saying, oh, you're not gonna be able to do electric, it's a bad idea, because, because, because. Well, in the doldrums, I just do the same thing, run it three to four knots. And generally in the doldrums, you have a lot of sun. So if you've got clouds, you've got wind. If you've got doldrums, you've got sun. I'm getting power off the solar. And obviously I can take the power from the solar and go right into the batteries and just take the difference and top up the batteries as the day goes on. So I can still make headway. The key thing to take away is I think that with this combination of a 5 and 10 kilowatt electric motor, switchable by belt, with two separate motor controllers, two separate cooling systems, and 100 kilowatt hours of power on my boat, I think I'm going to be fine. So, going back to what is phase three going to look like, this video and the following videos. It is largely going to be me trying to figure out how to get this controller working from the Arduino and all of the various circuitry I need to make that working. Hi Andrew, thank you for your help. And then get this controlling this, figuring out how to get all of that working and have everything built on the bench and have my throttles and controls and everything all set up and sorted with the batteries. That's going to be getting done on the bench, and that has to get done on the bench because I have an insurance problem. As I sit here right now on December 15th, December 16th, I reached out to my insurance company to say, hey, listen, I'm planning to do this conversion. Is this going to be a problem? Oh boy, is it going to be a problem. They said in no uncertain terms that as soon as I start the conversion, I am no longer insured. So as I sit here right now, the diesel engine is staying in the boat and I am not touching it and I'm not starting to remove it until I solve this insurance problem. As soon as the insurance is sorted out, then I can start ripping the diesel out, sell the diesel, use the proceeds from selling the diesel to order the propeller, and with the diesel gone, clean up the interior and start prepping everything for installing the batteries, figuring out what the motor mount plate is going to look like, yada, yada, yada. The actual conversion of the boat and the installation of the batteries and the motors is going to be the beginning of phase four. So phase three is gonna be all of the bench work, all of the theory, figuring everything out. And I should mention, all of the designs I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be sharing for free. Um, I'm gonna be publishing whatever sketches I write for the Arduino, the circuit diagrams, it'll all be available for free. So if anyone wants to do this themselves, 
I'm hoping with Andrew's help when I'm done to have a circuit board design that you could take and get printed. At, there's a bunch of companies now that you can send them a design, they'll send you back a circuit board. Then you just solder on your parts. So all of that will be free for everybody. So with all of that sorted, if I still don't have insurance at that point, then I can go in and start figuring out the new wind instruments, new depth sounder, new knot meter. I'll assemble those on the bench and we'll get those integrated as well. And I'll keep doing bench work until the insurance is sorted. Once the insurance is sorted and the battery and the motor is installed on the boat and the boat goes back in the water, the second part of phase four and the part that I am most excited about is sea trials. The current plan is that next summer, the next summer season is going to be sea trials, sea trials, sea trials. Everything is theory up until now. So I want to be able to take the batteries out onto the boat and run this thing and see what my numbers are. What speeds do I get for given input values? How much can I regen? This is something that is one of the things that is very, very, very poorly documented right now is regen numbers. One of the other things when I, was, uh, I didn't mention earlier when I was talking about the efficiency of the 5 kilowatt motor that I have no clue about is, is there going to be a regen difference? If I try to regen at lower winds, lower speeds with a 5 kilowatt motor, what is that power generation going to look like compared to the same speeds at the 10 kilowatt motor? So there's going to be experiments about that, range experiments, uh, it's going to be a lot of on the water testing. Whatever I learn next summer, when the boat gets hauled out for next fall, that's going to be my time to do whatever changes I can. And if things go well, in the summer of 25, I move on to the boat and we start traveling and she's all sorted. Well, it's a sailboat. It'll never be all sorted, but I digress. Okay, that was a hell of a lot of talking in this video. If you've stayed to watch this long, um, thank you, and I'm sorry. I really hope that this series is going to prove really valuable. I don't think it'll ever be very popular by YouTube standards, but I really hope it's valuable to anyone else who's thinking about doing their own conversion. This is going to be a lot of work, but damn, I'm stoked to get onto it. If, if you enjoy this and if you think others might enjoy it, could you do the usual YouTube doobly-doo thingy-majigs and like, subscribe, and all that kind of stuff? And if you're in the position and you really like this, I have a Patreon. Um, there's already a bunch of people there. We have a Patreon Discord. Uh, when I am traveling, I share my location in real time with all the patrons. I don't really have the different rewards flushed out, but we're working on it. We're, 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 we're building some rewards and we've got a pretty nice and active uh, Discord community now. So if you're in a position to join, i um, sure I'd love your support and love to see you around the community. And if the camera's moving, that's because Tatters is pushing up against the leg of the camera. All right, see you next time. Mm -hmm.